Welcome to today's lecture in our flagship Merix Future China lecture series. My name is Miko Tari. I'm the executive director of Merix, and it is my pleasure to host you for today's lecture on how China sees the world with Vijay Gokhale, former foreign secretary of India and currently a senior fellow at Merix. In this period of rising global tensions, but also one of re-engagement with China, it is critical for us here in Germany and Europe to provide you with the best possible integrated China research and fact-based differentiated analysis. And for us, this requires openness for dialogue and different perspectives, not just between different stakeholders in Europe, also dialogue with Chinese representatives, and most importantly for today, with leading experts across the world on their views and assessments of key trends that will shape the future of China and the world accordingly and our relationship with this important country. With this public lecture series, we hope to make some of these critical conversations more accessible to a wider audience. And for that reason today, I really look forward to a very timely conversation with a terrific guest and speaker. Welcome again, dear Vijay. We're honored to have you and to benefit from your experience and expertise at Merix. And I will introduce you properly in a minute. Let me also thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us online today. Allow me to say a few words about the arrangements and housekeeping. After a short introduction by myself, we will hear Vijay's lecture and then open the floor to a Q&A session. And as you can see, this is an open um, um, floor here. You are free to pose your questions in the chat. Uh, mind you, this is a fully public and recorded event. The stream will be available later. And with that, allow me to introduce our speaker. Vijay Gokhale was India's foreign secretary from 2018 to 2020. You also had the distinct honor uh, to serve as ambassador and representative to both China from 2016 to 17 and Taiwan. In fact, the only Indian foreign service officer to do so. You've been the Indian ambassador to Germany from 2013 to 16. And maybe more important for our conversation today, you are recognized as one of the leading global experts on China, fluent in Chinese, and there are simply only very few people with the depth of experience, the scope of perspective, and I can say that uh, by experience, the generosity to share your views and provide advice. Your insights into the changes in the Indian-Chinese relationship um, continue to provide clarity in a very dynamic um, world home to the largest populations on Earth with rapidly growing economies and great ambitions. This relationship itself will shape the course of the 21st century in matters of prosperity, peace and conflict, with far reaching implications also for us. The realm of analysis that you cover, however, is much wider and you're, you clearly have not retired from your intellectual leadership role. And let me briefly point the audience uh, to recent books and articles, including on the making of a protest, the Tiananmen Square um, uh, um, and your assessment of it, the story of China's rise after Tiananmen, the long game, how the Chinese negotiate with India, and uh, opinion pieces, for instance, in the New York Times on what world order China actually wants. And allow me to encourage everyone to read these contributions. Uh, these books and analysis have a remarkable blend of precision, historical depth and analytical clarity. And we in our community have already benefited tremendously from our exchanges with you. Thank you for that. And we want to share this pleasure with others. This is why we are here today. Your talk will deal with China's global role, self-perception and how others in the region see it. And with that, VJ, the floor is yours. Thank you again for being with us. We look forward to your lecture. Over to you. Thank you, Miko. Uh, it's a great privilege to be invited to deliver the Merrick's Future China series lecture. And uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as an Indian back home in India, 
I often get asked by younger people, how does it matter how China sees the world? And I have to remind them that as per World Bank data in 2021, the Chinese economy was at $17.7 trillion, which is more than 75% of the size of the economy of the United States. But more than the GDP numbers, if you look at any statistics, trade volumes, outbound investment, foreign exchange reserves, even the number of patents filed, China is up there among the three or four most important countries in the world. And of course, I also remind people in India that a lot of the things that we use in daily life have some part of it which is manufactured in China. It is the world's factory. And therefore, we cannot imagine a world without China. And the proper understanding of how China looks at the world, how it adjusts and adapts to changes, how it shapes our world, and what are the means to do it, becomes very critical for our national well-being, but of course for global well-being as well. Now, in my uh, long career in diplomacy of nearly 40 years, I found that the intellectual discourse is driven by research from the Western world. But of course, I am Asian, I live in Asia, but more importantly, half the world's population either lives in China or in the proximity of China. And therefore, it is important, particularly for those who live in the West, to know how people from the other half of the world actually think about China. And in order to understand how we look at China, and by we, I mean Asians or Indians, it is important to first see how the Chinese look at themselves. There is no doubt they look at themselves as an ancient civilization, uh, a civilization which has been glorious, which has been long, but also a civilization that was a major driver of the world's economy until about the year 1820. Uh, and therefore, they have a great sense of their history, of who they are as a people, of what China's place in the world should be. There is also, I think, a strong desire to expand the memories of China as the sick man of Asia. Uh, they take great pride in national rejuvenation as a major economy, as a country with global standing and influence. And frankly, much of the global South, including many Indians, can relate to this. This feeling, this sense of history the sense of national pride. But what is important to remember is that none of these, whether it is their sense of history, whether it is the idea of victimhood, whether it is the feeling of national pride, are particularly communist ideas. What the Chinese Communist Party has done is to very skillfully appropriate these innermost desires of the people of China and convert it into a narrative that says only the Communist Party of China can restore China's pride and place in the world. Only the Communist Party can expunge that sense of shame that they feel. And only the Communist Party can ensure that China becomes the world's leading power by 2050. And this then is their agenda. Now, it is important also to understand that China is not a normal country. And by way of example, I want to compare it to India. In 1947, when our Indian National Congress led the struggle for freedom from British colonialism, it converted itself into a government by constitutional means. In other words, the party and the state became separate, and the party's aims and goals were not necessarily the national objectives. But in 1949, when China was liberated by the Communist Party, the party became the state. The state's institutions exist and are co-opted solely to perpetuate the party's rule, to ensure its survival, to ensure its continuance in power. And therefore, it is important to recognize that we are not dealing with a normal country because the fate of this nation is directly linked to the fate of that party. And therefore, it is today a party state. 
And the question, therefore, is how does that party state look at the rest of the world? Well, we've heard the president of China many times talking about this once in a century change. And I often get asked the question, what does it mean? Because in the 20th century, there was the first and second world wars, which brought major changes. There was the Cold War and the ending of it, which brought major changes. The freedom of India and the decolonization movement also brought major changes. But I think what the Chinese mean by this is to refer to the First World War. Essentially, the First World War marked the end of the dominance of the old world of Europe and the rise of two entirely new forces which had not been seen on the world stage, the United States and the Soviet Union. And therefore, China thinks that in the first decades of the 21st century, it is that new force that is going to bring fundamental change to the rest of the world in this century. And I think uh, they therefore see this as a unique opportunity, but also increasingly as a strategic challenge, very recently expressed by President Xi Jinping at this National People's Congress session, when he said that Western countries led by the United States uh, are uh, imposing all round containment, blockade and suppression of China. Uh, therefore, the idea they have is that China is the change and the West is resisting that change. And this fundamental underpinning in their thinking is one factor that shapes their view of the world. The other factor that shapes their view of the world is the realization within the country that China still has to grow by at least 6% every year from now until 2049 which is no easy feat for a $17 trillion economy. And of course, the challenges they face are made much more difficult by a shrinking population, which means a declining workforce, of course, but also a gradual reduction in consumer spending and a higher cost for old people and for social welfare. And therefore, the pressing need to make structural changes to that economy so that domestic consumption increases, dependency on foreign markets uh, decreases, and quality of life expectations are met. So there is a, a, a pressure domestically that the party feels. And I would really sum it up as follows. I would say that domestic delivery in a hostile global environment, because the party's survival in the second century depends upon it, is really the driving force that shapes uh, China's view. So what is China's worldview then? In my mind, it consists of five important elements. First, the world is shaped by force and power, not by peace and diplomacy. And therefore, China believes that part of its rise in the world must come from its ability to enforce respect and to command obedience. And we are seeing a systematic modernization of their military capabilities, whether it is in terms of organizational structures like theater commands or jointness, new service arms like the Strategic Support Force, bases outside China such as Djibouti or Riem in Cambodia, and of course, extremely sophisticated weapon systems. Uh, for all their talk that they do not seek hegemony, uh, my perception is this is precisely what the Chinese are seeking. Secondly, the Chinese do believe that the United States is denying them every possible chance for a peaceful rise. They believe that they have adjusted to the West, but the West has not adjusted to their rise. And what we have seen in the second decade of this century is therefore a change of course. It now considers the West to represent Cold War thinking, to build a system of alliances against China. And it has proposed this idea that we have all started hearing about, which is the community for the shared future of mankind. Frankly, when people ask me what this means, I find it difficult to explain because this is a fuzzy idea and it is deliberately so. My sense is that its sole purpose is to 
encourage those who are disillusioned with the West to gather under the Chinese umbrella so that China will be able to leverage their support and their strength to dominate the multilateral system and to replace the West as the primary factor in that multilateral system. Thirdly, when China talks of rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, there is a subtext to it. And that subtext is the recovery of territories which China considers that were unjustly taken from it when, when they were weak. Uh, and this means not only Hong Kong and Taiwan, it also means the recovery of other territories, including what they call South Tibet, which is the Arunachal Pradesh state of India. So in my opinion, revanchism is a core part of Chinese policy. And contrary to their professed position that they settle disputes through negotiation and dialogue, if you see their recent actions in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Straits, in Ladakh, in the Indian state, uh, in the Indian Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, I think it points to their real intentions. They have also decided to build a strong wall on their periphery in the states which adjoin them by creating a sort of buffer zone, as well as through a more permanent presence in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, fourthly, the Chinese Communist Party understands that its legitimacy depends on the state of its economy, on the ability to deliver to the people. And this strategy has two arms. The external arm is the Belt and Road, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, most recently the Global Civilizational Initiative, essentially designed to provide markets and to win support to integrate the Asia Pacific into the Chinese economy. And they th think this is no different from what the United States did in Europe after the Second World War. Uh, the domestic arm of the strategy, of course, is uh, dual, you, uh, dual circulation, common prosperity, and innovation-led industry. And the last point is, to my mind, the most important. Xi Jinping believes that China's national experience has proved a fundamental premise of the 20th century to be wrong. And that premise is that democracy is a superior form of government. Now, in the 20th century, the message to the world was that democracy had successively defeated monarchies in the First World War, fascism in the Second World War, communism in the Third World War, in the Cold War, and that therefore, democracy was the best means for prosperity and well-being of the people. Well, China now says it is not so. They can show the world that they can develop faster, better, much more comprehensively than the West, and they don't have to be a democracy to do it. And this, therefore, is a very critical part of their worldview. Now, they have, of course, learned from the failure of the Soviet experiment. They don't intend to export communism as an ideology, but that doesn't mean that they don't seek to influence the national politics of other countries. Because it is extremely important to China that democracy as an ideology or as a means of politics must be discredited to prove the superiority of the Chinese model of governance. And therefore, much as we would like to believe that uh, they do not have any ill intentions towards the idea or the concept of democracy, my view is that this is in fact a core objective, the objective of discrediting democracy as a political idea in the 21st century. And therefore, what we are going to see in the next 10 years is a, a China which is much more assertive, which is going to utilize its power and its strength to persuade, and if required, even to coerce nations to bending to their will. So what can we really expect from them in the next 10 years? Firstly, I think they will talk about multipolarity. But in my view, they really want to see a multilateral world in which there is a strong bipolar balance. So we will see a multipolar world, perhaps, but with strong bipolar features. Secondly, their shared future of mankind idea is really intended to divide the world between the West and the rest. 
And this is classic balance of power politics. The Chinese love to tell us that balance of power politics should be left behind in the 20th century. But in fact, if you look at foreign policy from 1949 onwards, they practice very classic balance of power politics. Thirdly, the United States is an existential challenge for them. And therefore, uh, all other relationships will, in my opinion, be tested by them on the touchstone of Sino-US relations. I do not think that we in India or you in Europe should presume that the Chinese will determine their behavior to us solely or even largely in the bilateral framework. I think there is a strong American context within which we are all placed and upon which we will all be judged. Fourthly, I have said this very often, China is building a parallel universe. What is Belt and Road, if not an alternative trading system? What are the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank and the Silk Road Fund if they are not alternatives to the Bretton Woods institutions? What are WeChat, Alipay, Peitu, Huawei? Uh, it is, of course, very popular for us uh, to accuse the Americans and specifically President Trump of decoupling. But long before President Be Trump became the president of the United States, President Xi Jinping had already begun the process of decoupling. And this trend is likely to accelerate as the current decisions in the National People's Congress show the idea to set up a new Ministry of Science and Technology to uh, make to concentrate the focus of the state on high technology innovation, on data security, on supply chain resiliency, all intended, in my opinion, to build that parallel universe. Uh, and finally, of course, they are going to build the world's most powerful military. I think we don't, shouldn't have any further doubts about that. Uh, in fact, there are a number of very professional reports which suggest that they already have exceeded the United States in the number of capital ships and that by 2030, they will have more naval power in the Indo-Pacific than the four quad countries put together. Uh, now, I don't want to end this lecture by giving the impression that there are no vulnerabilities or problems. And this is recognized by the Chinese party and state itself. Uh, I want to give, quote what President Xi Jinping said in February 2021 when he opened the conference on the history of the Communist Party. His words were, the fortress can be breached from within. And this is a very important statement because if you see the subsequent actions, the frequent purges in the party, in the internal security services, in the PLA, uh, this is a sign of insecurity in the ruling class. The decoupling uh, is likely to hurt Chinese supply chains, but the Chinese feel securitization of the economy is important. Their aggressive diplomacy has awakened the neighbors to adopt a more hedging strategy, but again, they feel that that assertiveness is important for their own security. And therefore, what we are dealing with is a highly evolved economic entity which is politically brittle. And the world needs to factor this into their calculations. This is a way in which we need to increasingly perceive China, not as a country which is going to unstoppably rise, but as a country which also has certain problems. And those problems uh, are something we need to study much more carefully. Before I end, I think my last point is important. The West must be careful not to imagine that the rest of the world looks at China the same way as the West does. For the rest of the world, particularly what is these days called the Global South, meeting socio-economic expectations are a number one priority. And they are not greatly concerned about uh, what China's ideology is. The fact is China today offers a real option to them to end their dependencies on the West. They are providers of capital. They are also providers of technology and high technology at that, as well as equipment, which helps them build their economies. And, and many countries think that it helps push back against what they see as bullying tactics by the West. And therefore, 
when the West speaks about authoritarian tendencies in China, when, for instance, it refers to predatory behavior that Chinese companies are engaging in Africa or the bullying of neighbors, there are a lot of people in the global south who will say, what is China doing differently in the 21st century from what the West did in the 19th or 20th centuries? And therefore, this should be a sovereign thought for people who live in the West and who analyze China and study uh, uh, China. Because uh, the question that people will ask you is that if the West wants to pursue its interests just like China does, but wants to lecture the global South about values, then what is really the difference between China and the West? So I conclude, Nico, with uh, this last observation. We all need to look at a colossal force, a Leviathan, which is coming in our direction. I think we cannot avert our eyes. We cannot afford to blink. We must understand what this entity is because it is a force for both global good and for global destabilization. We have to stand our ground and we must, as uh, middle countries, uh, that is Europe and India, as well as other middle countries, try to shape them so that the, uh, the prevalence of good over what is difficult ultimately leads to the betterment of the 21st century. Because uh, I end with what I began with this lecture, China is a consequential force in this century, and I don't think we can envisage a 21st century without China. Uh, thank you, Biko, and thank you once again for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, to speak at the Merrick's uh, Future China Lecture. Thank you so much, Vijay. This was an extremely rich and, I should say, educative um, lecture already, uh, but we have the pleasure of engaging in a conversation on some of the key points that you've made and um, I, I see that the audience is already starting to ask questions which we will repackage for you in digestible ways hopefully but let me start with one question if i may uh, from my side um, and um, you've pointed to um, sources of chinese conduct not just worldview um, including historical traditional sources um, including specific aspects of Xi Jinping's worldview. Um, but I want to understand a bit deeper what um, your perspective is on the relevance of the party state, as you called it, uh, in terms of shaping not just China's worldview, but indeed uh, China's global conduct. So does it matter and in which way specifically that um, we have a very unique um, counterpart uh, in terms of the internal machinery and architecture of this political system. Thank you. Uh, I think it's important to understand that uh, in a democracy, when there is a separation between the party and the state, uh, even though the ruling party shapes policies, there are certain national interests and national objectives which transcend party political uh, agenda. Uh, those national interests are defined by civil society, and that includes parliament, it includes the free media, it includes non-governmental organizations, it includes people like you and me who vote our leaders in and out of power. Uh, in the case of China, however, uh, none of these uh, elements exist in that society outside the Communist Party. Uh, there is indeed a legislature, and there is a judiciary, and there is media. But the domination of the party within these institutions means that the party's objectives are made, or rather the, the objectives of these institutions are made to dovetail with those of the party. And I often, uh, for instance, give this uh, example uh, when I uh, speak about negotiations with the Chinese. Uh, and let me put it this way, Miko. When I negotiated with the Chinese, uh, for me, uh, there was uh, a sense that I was invested in what my government wanted me to do. But my own thinking was not shaped by that of the government. In the case of China, the negotiator essentially is negotiating on the basis of the party and the party's directive. 
uh, not on the basis of a national objective. And sometimes the party's objectives and national objectives may differ. In other words, they are much more rigid in thinking, less likely to compromise, less likely to think out of the box. Uh, and therefore more likely in a sense to uh, uh, to to um, sort of dictate a single path along which people follow. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say this is not a normal country we are dealing with, even though it looks normal. Thank you, Vijay. I have a question from the audience that I think um, fits nicely with this um, uh, point that you just made. Um, um, how how contested uh, um, it, are these worldviews internally in your assessment? I mean, there's clearly a dominant party line, and this is most likely what we have to expect in terms of um, who we engage with. Um, but the question is, um, how contested are their uh, views? How different um, are they? And what expressions, I assume, might th these different views also find as we move forward? I think we should be clear that uh, from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping, all leaders have essentially talked of a threat from democratic governments and specifically from the West, uh, which is seeking to subvert China through means of peaceful evolution. So uh, I think there is a consistent thread running through the history of the People's Republic of China, which says that outside forces are trying to undermine the Communist Party. But within this uh, basic thread, there are certainly differences within the Chinese leadership on how this problem should be managed. Uh, and the fact that we don't see it at the moment, because in an authoritarian system, things look much more monolithical than they really are, uh, uh, doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, we do know from the history of the Communist Party that no Chinese leader has been completely dominant for any length of time. Mao Zedong himself faced many challenges both before 1949 and after 1949. Deng Xiaoping himself faced major pushback from some of his peers. And in fact, two of his nominees as general secretary had to lose their jobs or lost their jobs. And therefore, there is no reason to presume that uh, Xi Jinping is unchallenged either. Uh, therefore, I think a much greater understanding of what is happening within China is important. But I think we can say this uh, with some degree of certainty that uh, over the last 10 years, he has gained strong control over the key levers of power. And uh, in the last party, Congress was able to prevail significantly over uh, his detractors in terms of getting his Politburo and his Politburo Standing Committee. And therefore, we should uh, not plan policy or, uh, uh, or plan any ideas around the fact that there is going to be uh, something which might uh, eject him from power in the near future. Uh, but what we have to watch out for is whether on economic policy and even on foreign policy, there is some internal pushback which leads to some adjustment uh, mm. in their behavior. Thank you, BJ. Uh, I, I think a key question that also comes through quite a few um, comments here is how global are China's ambitions? Um, you, you very consciously use the term hegemonic aspirations, and I wonder um, what the scope of that term is. Is it meant um, on a regional basis? Um, clearly, there are global initiatives now being, um, and you mentioned all of them, um, uh, developed and um, um, announced. Um, and a key question, obviously, also for the United States and us uh, will be, um, is this about global hegemony in terms of the overarching ambitions? Is it about being a leader or the leader in terms of comprehensive national power by 2049? Um, so maybe you can tell us a bit about the level of ambition that we're looking at, at here. Well, they use the word hegemony both in a global and regional context. So for instance, uh, they have no doubt that the United States is the global hegemon. But they have certainly used hegemony as a phrase to describe India in a regional or sub-regional context quite frequently. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, it, it is a flexible concept. Uh, but I think we should have no doubt 
from the words of President Xi Jinping that China is moving closer to the center of the world stage to suggest that they, at the very least, intend to be an equal power to the United States and at best to topple the United States from its perch as the number one power. Now, I think a bit of history is required to understand that the Chinese do not consider hegemony in the manner it is looked at in the West. Uh, uh, even in when the Chinese had a major empire uh, until the 19th century, uh, their hegemony consisted of uh, feudatory relationships or uh, tributary relationships where the smaller states surrounding China or the smaller kingdoms surrounding China acknowledged that China was the hegemon and in return the Chinese tolerated them and even legitimized their rule. Uh, so uh, what we might be looking at is a much looser form of hegemony where the international community broadly accepts that China is the major power and that its interests and concerns must be taken on board by everybody else. And provided you accept that, China in turn is willing to be magnanimous or, or uh, munificent or helpful in any way to you. I think that really is their idea of hegemony. Uh, they they don't look at their uh, uh, sort of hegemony in, in, in the very American context that they currently use to describe the United States. Thank you, Peter. I think it's time that we try to um, discuss a few, maybe at least one key frontier of global order and the way how China looks at it. And it is the China-Russia relationship in the context of broader um, global um, balance of power politics, as, as you've described them. And uh, we do struggle, um, I, I think, clearly in the West, um, and you see it with upcoming visits and internal conversations of Europeans about um, uh, the depth of, of that partnership, we do struggle to understand the nature of this relationship. And as it will be also a very consequential one, I'm specifically sitting here in Europe, uh, maybe you would like to share a few of your views on, on, on the nature of that relationship. Thank you. Well, I think that's an important partnership. Some might call it a formal alliance, some might call it a semi-alliance. But what is... Uh, beyond doubt now is that it suits uh, the leaders of both countries to build a stronger, closer partnership at a time when both of them face problems with the West. Uh, however, to my mind, we should bear a few things in mind. Uh, there are alliances where the two partners have a congruence of interests, and I would say the Anglo-American relationship is a typical example of that. They share a lot of common values and a lot of common interests. And on the other hand, you have a, a, a partnership or an alliance where the congruence of interests is less, but the preponderance of threats is greater. In which case, you are not standing face to face as the Americans and the British are, but back to back, as I believe the Russians and the Chinese are, each guarding the other's back, as it were. Because I really find that the congruence of interests are very few indeed. I don't just mean in terms of economic size or military capability, but even in terms of history, the way in which uh, the, the Russians consider themselves more Europeans, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of religion, where uh, in, in Russia the, the church is important, but China, in a sense, is an atheist state. Uh, it does, I mean, the communists do not believe in God. So uh, I think in terms of values uh, and even in terms of interests, there is less of a congruence and a greater uh, binding force is a collective suspicion of the West or a collective fear of the West. Uh, the second point I do want to make is that uh, this is a relationship between two leaders. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it is a relationship between two people, two peoples. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, uh, President Putin is probably the best bet available uh, for President Xi Jinping. Any leader who succeeds President Putin is more likely to be accommodative of the West 
I'm not suggesting that they will completely bend towards the West, but they will certainly try to improve their position by trying to accommodate some of the West's pressing requirements. And to that extent, that doesn't bode well for China. So President Putin's survival and continuance in power is important to President Xi. And therefore, I think that too is a binding force. Uh, but what I my last point is this, the efforts that the Russians make in ensuring, and certainly before the war in Ukraine, this was the case, in ensuring that it continues to maintain working relationships and even good relationships with countries like Japan, Republic of Korea, India, for instance, the Central Asian republics, would to my mind suggest that they too see the disadvantages of placing their hopes on a single country. Uh, they too have their concerns about China. And therefore, I think uh, sometimes we do not recognize the fact that uh, Russia has in fact reached out to some of these neighbors of China in the past and even now. Uh, and that is not simply out of some altruistic motive. It is also because of self-interest. Uh, and, and I think this fact needs to be borne in mind. In other words, this is a partnership of convenience. It is not a partnership where there is a fundamental congruence of values or interests. Thank you. And, and obviously there are other front lines that we would have to dig deeper into. But I want to at least spend a few minutes on the question of US-China relations because it's so front and center as you've outlined. And the perception that you've described that China is talking about multipolarity, but actually um, placing itself in a world of growing bipolarity and, act and working towards those ends. Um, we hear from the Chinese side over the past months um, that the problem with the United States cannot be solved anymore. Um, and they see themselves both locked in in an excess existential conflict. Um, and obviously the key question is not only for us, uh, how do we position ourselves as Indians or Europeans in, in this growing bipolarity, but also how do you expect the Chinese side to manage their relationship with the United States moving forward? Um, currently, there seems to be very little dialogue, hardly any guardrails, and um, the modality of uh, diplomacy seems to be out of um, the game. How do you expect the Chinese to uh, to navigate this growing tensions? Is it just going to be wolf warrior diplomacy and seeking conflict, or do you expect, as we currently see to some extent, a moderation of certain aspects of Chinese behavior? Thank you. Uh, I suspect that this is a problem with which the uh, both the official establishment and the strategic community in China are grappling with. Uh, there is a there, I think, are a sizable number of people in that country which uh, still believe that the the changes in the United States and to some extent the changes that have taken place in Europe are not structural, and that in a sense. Uh, if there is uh, some gesture on the part of China or some uh, dialogue with uh, those countries, uh, relations will return to the pre-2015 track. Uh, there are the others, of course, who believe that uh, the, the changes in the United States in particular are so fundamental that there is no possibility whatsoever of going back to that relationship. So I think at this stage, there is a certain degree of confusion and debate within China on how to deal with the United States. Uh, but what I think uh, we might see if they do come to the conclusion that uh, the changes in the United States are of a more permanent nature, uh, would be an effort to build a constituency uh, within the United Nations system, which would give it a majority of support in terms of the number of countries which uh, uh, would side with it in any discussion or debate between the West and China. Uh, I, I still believe my view is that uh, uh, China wants to keep the existing multilateral system because it suits them. They are one of the permanent members of the UN Security Council as well. So they're not looking to fundamentally change that system. But within that system, they want a dominant voice. Uh, and therefore, the only way to do it is to get the vast majority of the global south on your side. 
in addition to that, of course, if they can uh, improve relations with the European Union, with Japan, with some of the major emerging economies, uh, then that also adds to their uh, strength and credibility in dealing with the United States. Uh, and therefore, what I suspect uh, we would see in the next couple of years is at least an attempt by the Chinese to re-engage with these countries. We are seeing this already in Europe. I would think we might see this with Japan, with Australia, with uh, Republic of Korea, and so on. Uh, and uh, they will see whether this is going to lead them uh, to uh, a, a, a easier climate where they can deal with the United States or not. But the fact that there is a, a, a structural problem with the US, uh, I think is something that they're going to have to take a decision on pretty soon. Um, and once that happens, uh, what we might see is a further decoupling that takes place in certainly the sunrise industries, the industries where China thinks it has the edge. Um, and, and that poses a challenge for all of us because really the end of the Cold War meant that we had freedom of choice. We could choose what we wanted from, a, a, from a, an array of countries which had those technologies or had that capital or had that equipment. And now we may be going back into a situation where uh, we have to choose either or. Um, and therefore, certainly for, for the European Union or for India, uh, uh, these are regions with large populations and a large market. I think the choice is not between, uh, let us say, Huawei and the, and the Western 5G technology and the American 5G technology. It is evolving your own technological capabilities so that you are not completely dependent on either. And you have some means of standing up uh, and maintaining your independence in what is going to become an increasingly uh, sort of a bipolar tussle, certainly on the technology front. Uh, and therefore, I think this is where uh, uh, countries of the middle order uh, should and can and should collaborate. Uh, because if we don't all stand together, then these two economies are so much bigger than ours that we are really not going to be able to compete with them. Thank you, Vijay. And I think we're entering the territory indeed of thinking about what our own responses need to be in such an environment. And I would like to give you the opportunity to maybe comment a little bit on what you expect India's position to be and evolve into in a context of potentially growing decoupling um, Chinese revanchism and assertiveness and um, a capacity that is growing to enforce, shape um, global alignments and um, action across the world. Um, India is a neighbor of uh, of China and it has a particular effectiveness and we, we don't have enough time to do justice to the depth of that relationship. But um, and you've, you've mentioned technological sovereignty and partnering with other countries is, is key. Um, but tell us a bit more about um, maybe the de-risking of India uh, that it is pursuing vis-a-vis -vis China and how this might move forward. Thank you. Well, we have a troubled relationship, one which has got into uh, more trouble uh, in 2020. Uh, and at the moment, I think the leadership on both sides is grappling with the issue of how to bring that relationship back on normal track. Uh, India is quite clear, our foreign minister has explicitly stated that unless provocation on the line of actual control in the border area stops, the relationship cannot return to normal. So I foresee a decade of uncertainty and of tension. Uh, that having been, so what we are looking at is India dealing with China in a situation where we are economically and military disadvantaged but where our own economic and military capacities are likely to grow because our economy is doing fairly well. Uh, so uh, the, the issue then is one of risk management. And that risk management it has to be done both at the political level uh, with the reopening of dialogue, which so far has not fully reopened, uh, as well as at the 
level at the functional level where problems occur, whether it is on the border or it is you know, on matters relating to the Dalai Lama or uh, on, on our concerns vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and the China-Pakistan economic corridor and so on uh, and so forth. So really that's where the discussion and the debate uh, uh, is going to take place. Now, I think that uh, in this context, the one concern that we have is the continuing refusal of China to accept that India has its own agency. Uh, the Chinese typically have always uh, placed us as an adjunct power uh, and taken us seriously only when they see us as aligned to somebody else, whether it was the erstwhile Soviet Union, whether it is the United States today. Uh, now, it is important that China recognizes that we have uh, both the political will and the capacity to be uh, an independent uh, country and an independent power and to start dealing with us in that manner. I suspect if they do, things will be smoother. If they don't, things will become more complicated. But I want to end with this. And I think that we have, I think, a fairly sensible and mature leadership on both sides, uh, which realize, who realize that conflict is not an option or let me say large scale conflict is not an option. And therefore, uh, while we may see a period of tension and armed coexistence while this relationship is being readjusted, I don't foresee, uh, uh, I could be wrong, but I don't foresee uh, any large conflict between these two countries. I think there is a, an interest both have to ensure that there is peace and stability in that region. Thank you, Vijay. And um, I, I wanna, um maybe conclude this session today giving you again an opportunity despite the fact that you've already i think outlined very clearly the building blocks of, of china's um, worldview and um, global ambitions maybe to um, tell us again what do you think are we getting wrong about china's ambition um, what is it that we have to take more seriously? You pointed to the nature of the party state uh, about uh, certain traits and behaviors, etc. But um, help us uh, maybe with a few final words um, to understand what is it really that we need to get better in terms of our analysis first? And then finally, what are your recommendations to us here in Europe uh, in terms of the design of our China policies. As you know, Germany and other partners are currently looking quite intensely at that. Um, so what do we need to get right, uh, both in terms of our understanding, in terms of our policies? Thank you. Well, I I, I can hardly presume to tell uh, uh, people here in Europe, but certainly back home in India, I think first and foremost, we need to increase our understanding of China's internal politics. Uh, we have tended to, uh, at times, uh, glorify that uh, without recognizing that, uh, uh, that the domination of a single party is an aberrant system. Uh, uh, and uh, we need to figure out what the aberrations of that system are because it is vulnerable like others, perhaps much more vulnerable than democracies. We need to prepare for uh, a collapse, uh, and it could even be a catastrophic collapse of that system the way the Soviet Union collapsed. I'm not saying the circumstances are the same, but uh, a non-democratic system tends to collapse much, fa much faster than a, and a democratic system tends to collapse. And we have not, I fear, factored that into risk management, mm -hmm. whether it is political risk management or economic and, and commercial risk management. We tend to think, and the Chinese want us to believe, that China's rise is unstoppable, inevitable, uh, and unidirectional. So I think that's the first thing we need to do. The second thing certainly uh, that India needs to do, and I think the rest of the world should do as well, is to reduce dependency on certain key sectors of the economy. Uh, we are completely over-dependent, for instance, on renewable energy. Uh, because the Chinese control the entire supply chain on uh, photovoltaics. Uh, and uh, uh, we, I fear we, are, we might be getting into that sort of a situation in many of the other new and emerging technologies as well. Uh, now, if uh, I think India has certain core capabilities, including research, development, and human resources. Uh, Europe has its own very strong capabilities, including in, in R&D and in terms of uh, the financial resources. 
And I think we should look at each other quite seriously, even in terms of levering each other's capabilities, because alone, uh, by ourselves, I think onshoring might be desirable on paper, but can't really be implemented in practice, because there is a commercial uh, motive to all onshoring as well. Uh, and sometimes China is so competitive that even if we want to onshore, it doesn't make economic sense. Uh, and therefore, collaboration, in my view, is the answer. Uh, and we haven't really done much work in that, uh, Europe and India. Uh, so I would certainly think that is the second uh, thing we need to do. Thirdly, I think in terms of foreign policy, uh, there is a need to reform the international institutions. Uh, it is time the Security Council was expanded. It is time the United Nations was transformed. It is time that emerging economies got a bigger voice in the Bretton Woods institutions. To the extent that the West resists this, the tendency of countries even like India is to go with alternatives. We are the second largest shareholder in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and that is not a coincidence. So I think uh, the West needs to think about this. Um, I mean, I don't need, I don't want to preach, but these are really views that I've held for a long time, and I thought this is a good opportunity to to talk about them. Thank you, and we appreciate it. Um, and um, realizing that uh, we definitely cannot um, uh, do justice to all the brilliant questions that have been asked in the chat, also. Let me use the final two minutes to at least um, pose one very uh, nicely phrased question here, um, which is, um, what do you think will come first, China's rise to the dominant world power or the Chinese system breaking up under the pressure or changing dramatically? under the pressure of its social and other contradictions. Now, uh, uh, we're not in the business of predictions, but maybe you can use that as a platform to tell us about the balance of these two extremely um, um, challenging developments uh, internally and externally. Thank you. Well, I would say that the world tends to give credence to the first and doesn't think about the second uh, often enough. Uh, and the fact remains that as you become more and more prosperous, you do tend to think about your rights and not just your responsibilities. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, it seems to me sometimes that uh, it will become difficult uh, for the Chinese party to explain to its people why a country which is its neighbor like India, which is as big and as complex, uh, allows its leaders to be voted in and out of power. Uh, and uh, uh, information age is an age in which you can try to build firewalls, but ultimately uh, the spread of information is much faster than at any time in human history. Uh, so uh, we should not discount the power of ideas. And I think uh, uh, countries like India and democracies in general have that power with us. Uh, so um, uh, what I would say is that we need to certainly study the internal aspects of China uh, to see whether we are seeing within the Chinese populace the feeling that having gained this economic prosperity, uh, they should. Why are they being denied the right to select their leaders? Uh, and I think that's important. Thank you, Vijay, for concluding what has been a fascinating tour de force. Uh, uh, with very precise uh, and in-depth analysis of uh, China's worldview and a few critical issues in terms of China's global posture and rise and how we need to respond to it. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Gokhale, for the second Merrick's Future China lecture. And uh, uh, thank you all um, in the audience for joining us today. We look forward to having further conversations on these and many other issues in the future. Have a very nice afternoon and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you.